Okay, hi, I'm uh, Scott Jones. I'm acting director of the Electronic Frontiers Georgia, uh, of Electronic Frontiers Georgia. And um, tonight's presentation is Georgia Legislative Proposals to Regulate Social Media. And our speaker is uh, Georgia um, uh, Attorney Ron Daniels. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, just a minute, I'll go ahead and ask Ron to introduce himself. Just a few preliminaries, uh, if you could please um turn off your microphone and your camera at this time if you have questions go ahead and feel free to put them in the chat area at any time um but then when we get into question and answer when we get into the question and answer phase at the end of the talk um you can turn on your microphone and your speaker at that time if we we'll turn on your microphone and your camera at that time if you'd like to ask a question or you can continue to just put your question into the chat and we'll watch the chat area for questions. Um, so at this time, let me go ahead, as soon as, as Ron pops back up, <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started. He's, uh, looks like he's reconnecting. By the way, yeah, I'd like to say that these bills, we're talking specifically about SB 393 and SB 394. Um, the, I guess the, the title of the talk implies that they, you know, it might imply that they only regulate, um, that they only regulate social media, but in fact, they much, they may be much broader than that. And, and, uh, the extent to which they are broad, um, they may have some unintended consequences. It's, it's one of the things we'd like to talk about. Um, at this time, I see Ron is back on the stream. Uh, I want to go ahead and get you to, uh, introduce yourself and then, uh, we can get started. Yeah, I'm Ron Daniels. I'm a uh, consumer protection attorney here in Georgia. Uh, practice primarily all over the state, but I'm located in Little Georgia. I do a lot of uh, random alphabet soup type of cases, is what we call them. But uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, uh, a lot of Georgia Fair Business Practices Act, and a lot of work uh, related to consumers' privacy and when when their rights get violated under those various acts. Okay, um, let's go ahead. Do you want to start with uh, SB 393? Yeah, um, and so 393 is titled, and I, I think it's kind of interesting what they've uh, created as the legislative title for Senate Bill 393 is known as the Common Carrier Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, and essentially, common carrier in this sense is being meant to use as a essentially as a communication medium. Uh, and what the act starts out by doing is noting essentially that uh, social media has become so ubiquitous that it is the equivalent of uh, telephone communication lines or something of that nature and attempts to regulate uh, social media providers and websites what and, what and how they can censor certain things. And uh, it, very much in particular, when it gets to its definitional section, uh, it, it takes a pretty clear aim at defining what censorship means. And it includes editing, uh, altering, blocking, banning, deleting, removing, deplatforming, demonetizing, deboosting, regulating, restricting, inhibiting, um, denying equal access of visibility to, suspending rights to post, removing or otherwise discriminating expression is how they define censorship uh, in other parts of the definitional sections and throughout the, the proposed legislation, they uh, go forth and uh, define things such as, well, not necessarily defining, but include things such as shadow banning. And uh, essentially what this is, is aiming at, it seems to be a reaction to uh, the past couple of years, folks, people are getting banned on various social media platforms are feeling like they're, they're being demonetized on platforms such as YouTube or Twitch or other platforms allow users to get money, uh, but also just social media platforms uh, removing the ability of people to post and make comments. 
Um, the, the really sort of interesting part about this is it, it takes a very broad view of what a social media platform is. Uh, it, it doesn't just mean a website. Uh, it includes applications, uh, so uh, something like Facebook or Twitter. Uh, there's the both the actual website portion of it, but as well as the applications that people have on their phones or on their computers. Uh, and it takes this very broad defining brush to what it content, considers to be a social media platform, which is probably correct if you're trying to define what a social media platform is. But um, it, it does exempt uh, websites or applications that consist primarily of news, sports, entertainment, cultural, or artistic features, uh, or community information, uh, or content that is generated, uh, is not generated by users, but is rather pre-selected by the provider. Uh, and that is just sort of a weird exemption they put in there, not really sure what exactly that is trying to get at, but uh, it, it sort of creates a little bit of ambiguity in terms of if, if information is being randomly generated or pre-selected by the website, you, it can still be created by a user and then actually generated and spit up to other users uh, by the website, whether or not it's included. Uh, it's sort of, I guess, up to debate uh, within the definitions. Um, and, and so really the meat of it is uh, the law attempts to make it where a common carrier, such as a social media platform, shall not censor or discriminate against a user, a user's expression, or a user's ability to receive the expression of another user based on the viewpoint of the user or another person, the viewpoint represented in the user's expression or another person's expression, or a user's geographic location in this state or any part of the state, um, the actual or perceived race, color, ethnicity, religion, religious beliefs, political beliefs, political affiliation, national origin, sex, gender, orientation, or disability of a user. Uh, and it, it applies regardless whether the viewpoint is an expression that is communicated on or through uh, that platform or otherwise. So it, it doesn't just apply when, uh, for instance, if, if somebody was saying something on, uh, on uh, Twitter and they did not get in trouble on Twitter and got didn't get banned on Twitter for saying it, but they got banned on Facebook for what they were saying on Twitter. It, it applies to that just as much as it would as if you put it on the actual original website that created the issue. Um, the, this is almost entirely, I think, a reaction to uh, you know, whether or not it's real or just perceived issues from the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I don't think I need to go into too much depth explaining uh, what, you know, what all has been going on in terms of social media. Uh, we're obviously, it, you know, all pretty, pretty more savvy than the average person. So we have some idea of uh, big tech, uh, social media, the issues that they've been faced with Congress and, and other states trying to pass laws such as this. Um, the interesting thing is that there's a almost a preemptive strike against terms of services. Um, and the very second portion of this proposed legislation beyond the definition section actually says a contractual or other waiver or purported waiver of the protections provided by this chapter is void as unlawful and against public policy. And so, uh, if you had a website that said, well, we can ban anybody for any reason uh, that we so choose at any point in time uh, based on the content they are creating and putting on our website, uh, this would ostensibly ask to say, no, you can't do that. Um, and, and that's a really interesting concept. Uh, and I say it's an interesting concept because uh, you know, we're talking about private entities. We're not talking about a government entity, um, but it's being treated because of 
the prevalence of social media, uh, it is being treated as a public utility. Uh, that, that's the direct analog to it, just like a power line or a telephone line or airwaves, anything of that nature, it's being treated as a public utility. And so uh, the law is, or what the law is trying to do is uh, essentially prevent these private businesses and private entities from uh, censoring what you content they wish to censor. Um, that creates somewhat of an issue, uh, particularly because, uh, you know, it is a private entity, is a private business, because most of these are for profit businesses. Ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, you know, they should have some say set over what sort of content they wish to allow to have on their website. Um, and perhaps the the intent of this legislation is to avoid uh, what we would call in other aspects of the law is arbitrary and capricious uh, sort of standard uh, where you just say, oh, well, we're going to uh, take some sort of enforcement action against this one user and not this other user, even though they're basically doing the same thing. Uh, you know, whatever the intent is, I think it creates a problem because you're ultimately telling private entity what sort of content they can allow on their website. Uh, the the <laughs> The part that, that really troubles me as a consumer protection attorney, more so than anything uh, else, and, and when I talk about things like this, I, I always like to give the disclaimer, I, I'm not trying to take it necessarily a pro or uh, against uh, stance on any sort of legislation. I'm just trying to explain what the pieces of it that are there are trying to do. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have my personal feelings, but I'm I'm not trying to display those and trying to, to sway anybody's opinion. I'm just trying to explain what each section does. Uh, but the part that troubles me the most as a consumer protection attorney that uh, I see in this in the functional level is that uh, there's a provision here that says, it shall not be construed to subject a common carrier to damages or other legal remedies to the extent a common carrier is protected from such remedies under federal law uh, or, or to the extent that they are authorized to act this way under federal law uh, and to the extent that they can uh, limit expression that unlawfully harasses individuals or unlawfully incites violence or expression that is obscene, lewd, levacious, filthy, excessively violent, or harassing. Um, that is such a, I mean, you can literally find any peg you want uh, and put in these holes. Um, and that's just, in effect, this, this statute, if, if it passed as it is written, uh, these loopholes are big enough to drive a Mack truck through uh, just because it, there's nothing in it that says you can't define uh, any sort of content that's put up there as harassing uh, or lewd or obscene. Uh, you know, what, what is obscene? Uh, is it the standard of which we say, you know, when something is pornography or do, is it the standard in which we say, well, it's, uh, they use a lot of color from metaphors and so it's obscene language. Um, you know, this is just way open to interpretation, uh, and ultimately, I think it probably makes it where this is almost unenforceable as it is written. Um, the, the other part that kind of gets to, uh, I guess, a, a, a interesting facet of it is it requires common carriers such, you know, we'll say, say Facebook or Meta, uh, to publish on its website a biannual transparency report uh, for a six-month period preceding the publishing report uh, that goes through essentially user complaints and provides that information to users so that users can say, well, they you know they resolve complaints like this or they they are infringing upon people's rights because they don't resolve these complaints properly. Uh, and here's where we get to uh, essentially the enforcement mechanism, uh, which is uh, if you're following along in the actual uh, PDF, it's page eight and starts around line 183. Uh, it provides that a 
user of a website can bring a civil action, uh, either in a representative capacity or as a class representative, uh, they can enforce this act. So basically unban themselves uh, for lack of better terminology, uh, and they can recover injunctive relief, declaratory relief, um, and reasonable court costs and attorney's fees. Um, and uh, it also makes, from my perspective, a very interesting uh, provision uh, that it's a violation of this act, also a violation of the Georgia Fair Business Practices Act. Um, that, to me, is a big signal that whoever uh, is responsible for writing this uh, either is, I don't know that they're not cognizant of what the Georgia Fair Business Practices Act says, or that it's just sort of a disconnect and somebody needs to, to think through this a little bit better. But the, the interesting portion of that, uh, from somebody who uses the Georgia Fair Business Practices Act probably more frequently than 98% of other lawyers in the state of Georgia, uh, the Fair Business Practices Act requires actual damages uh, in which the statute basically can have, uh, in, in theory, none uh, because it doesn't provide for uh, you to have damages bringing a civil claim underneath it in the first place. Um, and the Georgia Fair Business Practices Act also prohibits you from acting as a class representative. You can only bring an individual claim. So uh, you know, it's interesting that they include that a violation of this is also a violation of the Fair Business Practices Act because it actually, if you compare the two of them, uh, they don't work together, they contradict each other. So um, the the thing Scott and I were mentioning before we actually went live with this uh, tonight is uh, 393 seems to be the one that is moving through the Senate um, more than 394, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, I, I do not know, uh, you know the chances of this being passed or not. Uh, the best I can tell, there's no analog in the House. Uh, we're not yet to crossover day for the Georgia legislature. So uh, whether this makes it or not by the end of the year, I, I really do not have an answer for you in that regard. Uh, but from a perspective of uh, somebody who would have to deal with this on a legal perspective, I, there there's issues uh, with it. Uh, just from an enforcement perspective, um, there are probably issues in the grand scheme of things to the extent that it's uh, that it, 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 it contradicts other states. Uh, there's probably a business issue there. Uh, and that's something I'll talk about in a minute when we're talking about 394, that uh, obviously there's an interest in having not necessarily uniform uh, laws across the entire country, but uh, certainly it makes it difficult for larger technology companies uh, if you have uh, 50 states with 50 different rules on the same thing and they start contradicting each other, uh, that certainly creates a problem. Um, but it, it is, uh, you know, it, I started out with reading the title of it and I keep going back to it. It sort of has one of those innocuous feel good kind of titles of the Common Carrier Non-Discrimination Act. And you, you hear that and you think, well, that can't be uh, too bad, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like a terrible thing. You, uh, and then you start reading it and you, you start having lots of questions about it. Um, I, I'm going to go to uh, 394, which is the much longer uh, proposed legislation, the one that appears to be kind of stalled out. Um, and this is almost uh, it's not verbatim, but it is uh, a copy in many respects of the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, if you happen to have heard me talk about that before, uh, I think what I said when right after that passed, when I was asked to talk about the Consumer uh, Privacy Act of California, 
is, is that eventually you were going to see basically every state adopt something similar uh, and that it would, you wouldn't really see anything that would deviate too much in, in the sense that it contradicts uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, and the reason for that is quite simple. There's a large number of technology companies in California. Uh, there's a large number of internet companies in California and there's 40 million people. Uh, we all somewhat can appreciate that uh, these businesses don't want to have uh, 50 very different sets of rules uh, for every different state that they are in. And so when you have a state that's large like that with a large number of people and there's a large number of companies and they get out ahead of everybody with uh, the prototype, uh, you know, with one of these privacy protection acts, uh, that tends to set the stage for what everybody else will do. Uh, you'll see other states do things that are uh, similar. Uh, you'll see states do things that are a little bit weaker or more lax, and you will see states do things that uh, have more stringent requirements or more, uh, you know, more enforcement heavy uh, type of provisions, but you won't see anybody do something that really directly contradicts uh, because it, it would create an impossible business environment, essentially. Um, and so uh, I, I, I take the position that this is actually some pretty good legislation. Um, it, you know, from a you know, from an enforcement perspective and from how it's written, uh, it has the benefit, as I said, of uh, not necessarily being verbatim copy of the California Consumer uh, Privacy Act, but it is there are provisions in it that are almost identical, uh, and there are some significant differences. Um, but essentially, what it is working to achieve is uh, to protect your data and to make a a system in which you can have a say in how uh, businesses are collecting your data and what they're doing with it ultimately. Um, and the the actual legislative findings, I think, in, in this one are a little bit more interesting than in the other one we, we just talked about. Uh, and they call this one the Georgia Computer Data Privacy Act, um, which is a pretty accurate description but it notes that individuals within the state have a right to prohibit retention use or disclosure of their own personal data and that's basically the upshot of this whole thing is that uh, we're working on creating a system in which uh, your you you have a say so in how businesses collect and use information uh, about you uh, whether they get it from your phone and, and you or from your browser or however they get it and you've probably noticed in the last couple of years that most websites are now getting to where you have a pop-up, you have to say yes or no. Uh, when you're purchasing things from, from online vendors, you're given these options about what can happen with your data. So most of these companies in reaction to the California Consumer to Act are already uh, doing a lot of these things. Um, perhaps uh, a little bit better than California, uh, in terms of uh, defining things, it, it, we have a wider description uh, when you drill down on page three uh, from lines 48 to 57. Uh, the actual, what we define in terms of uh, biometric information in, is a more tightly defined uh, but wider array of, of types of information, types of data, uh, than what you see in the California Consumer and Privacy Act. Um, the, the real sort of difference between the two in terms of definitional uh, comes when you get to uh, the, the issues about uh, what publicly available information is. Uh, it's very close uh, to what's in the California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, but there is some some exemptions to it that are a little bit different. Uh, perhaps most notably, though, is that it, uh, it is very clear in that it, it is tied to information no matter how it is collected. And, and there's been some other acts of um, 
uh, you know, that they actually take the position of trying to limit what the scope of that is. Um, but this is a very wide definition. Uh, it, it, it's not verbatim from the California Consumer Privacy Act, but it kind of stands on it. And I see we have a, a, a statement in the chat, and I'll, I'll just kind of read it out. But David says that uh, he's noticed that when he's opting out of certain internet marketing tracking, they sometimes ask you for resident California. Uh, and that's absolutely in response to that California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, some of these companies are more sophisticated uh, in terms of how they're aggregating the data and what they're doing uh, is basically if a state doesn't have some sort of established policy uh, and they feel like they can still within within the confines of the California Consumer Privacy Act still use data from folks from other states, they, some of them are. I obviously am not a programmer. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I have no business programming. The last time I programmed anything, it was a website using uh, PHP back in 2004. Uh, and so uh, I've not seen the back end of any of these things, but I, I do understand the, the legal aspect of having to comply with the laws. Uh, but from what I understand, some of these companies are trying to target information and, and essentially use what they can from other states and users from other states while they still can. Because, I mean, it's basically the wild, wild west outside of a few I think we're up to five or six states that have some sort of analog to the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, the, the the part that that uh, is sort of interesting when you get to uh, how they define who this applies to. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chuck, uh, that's exactly right. Um, that's but you, you said that a little bit more eloquently than I did, but I was trying to be a little bit more politically correct. Um, but uh, when they define what businesses uh, this applies to, uh, it's really sort of interesting to me to compare to the California Consumer Privacy Act because um, it includes businesses that call, do business in the state. Well, what does it mean to do business in the state? Um, does it mean you have to have a physical brick and mortar here? Does it mean you have to have commercial assets here? Uh, or does it just mean that you engage in some level of commerce in Georgia? Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think if I'm reading this the way um, that, that I think is the only way you can read it, um, you, it, it could apply essentially to anybody who does any sort of business anybody in the state of Georgia, uh, but it, it, is a, it is a conjunctive definition, so there's some subparts. Um, one subpart is they collect consumers' personal information or has personal information collected on the business's behalf, but obviously we wouldn't be talking about the business if they didn't do that because they're not collecting data, they're not collecting data. Um, alone or in conjunction with others determines the purpose for and means of processing consumers' personal information. Again, uh, if we weren't talking about having consumers' data and using consumer data, then we wouldn't be talking about it at all. Um, has annual gross revenue an amount that exceeds 50 million? Uh, this is a number that actually is higher than what's in the California Consumer Protection or Privacy Act. Uh, I believe the, the limit there, if I remember right, is 25 million. Uh, here it's 50 million. Um, alone or in combination with others, annually buys, sells, or receives or shares for commercial purpose the personal information of 100,000 or more consumers, households, or devices, and derives 50% or more of the business annual revenue from selling consumers' personal information. Um, so, uh, you know, it is as wide open as this is in terms of, of enforcement. Uh, it, it does kind of limit this to essentially big data collection companies. Uh, you have to have 100,000 or more consumers' data before we were talking. You have to have $50 million of revenue. Um, so the, the number of companies this applies to, you know, we're not talking about some small outfit in Norcross, Georgia, 
uh, that may have 5,000 people's information. It does nothing for a consumer whose information is with somebody like that. Um, whereas I, I think the California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, while it does have a floor, uh, I think the floor is a little bit uh, easier to obtain in California. And again, I think that's probably because, um, it, you know, they have so many tech companies, they have so much going on. Um, and, and, and we have a discussion right now with John. Uh, yeah, it, it is total. So it is not just in the state of Georgia, it's $50 million in gross revenue. Um, so it, it, it can be from the $45 million from Canada and $5 million from Arizona and $1 from Georgia and it still meets that definition. Um, the, the, the other thing that really kind of sets us apart from the California Consumer Privacy Act um, is we, we have one of these clauses in, that we have in a number of statutes in Georgia that says it's to be liberally construed to affect its purposes and to harmonize to the extent possible with other laws of the state relating to privacy or protection of personal information. Uh, and when there's a contradiction, uh, it wants there to be the greatest, the greatest privacy or protection to consumers available. So if two statutes disagree with each other, uh, the ultimate purpose is to make sure we're protecting consumers. Um, the California Consumer Privacy Act really, uh, it's clear that's what the intent is in it. Uh, they perhaps do a little bit better job of harmonizing uh, their statutes in uh, in the passing of the act and repealing conflicting ones. Uh, this is not really repealing conflicting ones, it is essentially just bootstrapping them in, uh, leaving them there and just saying, whichever one provides the greatest protection uh, is the one that would survive. Um, it, it does allow the Georgia Technology Authority to adopt rules and regulations necessary to implement, administer, and enforce this article. Um, that is an interesting take uh, because that's a, you know, that's another layer of some level of government uh, issuing rules and promulgating. It's the legislature basically deferring to them to have them uh, to create rules that and these companies will help them have to abide by that uh, or, or in addition to uh, what is actually in this proposed legislation. Um, the basics of it, when you get down to what it does in terms of function, uh, you have a right to have information deleted or your data deleted uh, by businesses. Uh, you have a right to know what sort of information has been collected um, and you have a right to command the opt-out of being subject to your information being sold uh, and so it, it functions very much like the california consumer privacy act because it uh, that's you know both of these are very lengthy laws uh, but when you get down to it that's what the function of both of them are to do is to to provide a mechanism to opt out, to provide a mechanism for you to know what data is a business has or may have sold about you, uh, and to, to empower you and give you the right to demand that they delete that information. Um, the, the, the interesting part about the Georgia uh, proposed legislation that is um, somewhat more consumer friendly than California uh, is that it it allows for governmental enforcement through the Attorney General's office, but it also allows for the bringing of private rights of action. Um, and the the unique part about that is it, it sets a statutory damage. Uh, a statutory damage is a you don't actually have to suffer uh, actual damages. You don't have to have your your identity compromised or somebody find something out about you that. Uh, you don't want them finding out or you don't have to find your your passwords or information on some other website. You don't have to have some monetary harm uh, to bring a claim to force this. 
um, you instead can get up to $2,500 for uh, each violation that a business commits uh, if it's just a normal violation. If you can prove that it's intentional, uh, you get statutory damages of up to $7,500 per violation uh, with no cap on uh, the number of violations there can be. So theoretically, um, you could have $100,000 worth of statutory damages if a business was that flagrant. Uh, Brian has asked a question, isn't it true that commerce that crosses state lines falls under federal regulation? Uh, so, so that's a question of uh, uh, really about dual sovereignty. Um, if, if there is a federal law uh, at some point in time that that does the same thing, it is going to be the one that that everything has to bow down to, and and it's what would control it. Uh, but there isn't a federal law yet that covers all of this, um, and so. That's how the consumer, the California Consumer Privacy Act has, has gotten into place um, and, and kind of moved along is because there wasn't a federal law. So basically, the states are stepping into where there's already a void legally. Uh, if, if there is a federal law that uh, contradicts part of this or does the same thing, it absolutely is going to essentially invalidate uh, this and the other states' uh, efforts. To, to regulate this type of data collection and establish those rights. Um, and the, your next question is a business that isn't registered with the Georgia Secretary of State be expected to comply with the state's regulations where they're not registered. And, and that's actually right. It's the the focus of these, these statutes or this proposed legislation and what uh, they've done in California and a couple other states uh, is more so with the 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 users rather than where the business is uh, you know they they have these definitions that say when you are when you're not doing business somewhere but uh the ultimate sort of break come to say oh well it's you know, you're subject to georgia's law is uh are you dealing in fact with georgia users or california users uh that's a very good question um and I think I previously gave a, when we talked about California several years ago, uh, yeah, I sort of took the jaded position that I didn't think Congress was going to uh, get to the point where they would pass a law um, to take place and, and to fill that void. And uh, they have not done it yet. Um, it certainly is conceivable that that would be something they get on their agenda someday and actually do. Uh, but uh, I, I don't, I don't know that I would hold my breath. Um, but the, the private right of action enforcement mechanism the statute would have is sort of a, a very robust one. Um, it, it also allows for injunctive relief, actually forcing businesses to comply with the statute. Um, and, and I know in particular that the EFF thinks that uh, that sort of private right of action is a good enforcement mechanism. I personally like it because this is the type of statute that I use regularly. Uh, it's what we call a fee shifting statute. It empowers people to act essentially as private attorneys general. Um, and it allows for you to recover your attorney's fees and your costs if you prevail. And so, uh, you know, that's probably the best way to have uh, these types of statutes enforced. Uh, just because I mean, as sad as it is, states don't have necessarily the the resources to run down these things all the time and to enforce all these statutes. Uh, sometimes, when the 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 violation of the statute in and of itself is is not uh, something that's widespread, or um, you know, you know, it, it's sort of where I'm, anytime your data is involved, I hesitate to use the word minor, uh, but in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, if you know, if you have something that's compromising people's data, that's thirty million people, or three million people, or three hundred thousand people versus three people, uh, certainly states going to be more interested in trying to enforce that. But uh, having private right action sort of makes a level playing field uh, and it gets you around that. 
Uh, but it does allow the state of Georgia to enforce it and to uh, recover its cost as well. Um, we have another question about signing agreements that uh, state that the jurisdiction is squarely in business where the state. Um, yeah, I, I don't know whether or not those type of agreements would invalidate this or not. Um, it, it's sort of, you really sort of can't contract out of laws that you have to comply with. Uh, you can when it's a purely uh, business type of thing and it's a civil law, but uh, you know, when you're setting consumer privacy and you're talking about things, it's not necessarily a criminal statute where there's some sort of criminal penalty, but when they, they set for a basic minimum requirement, I don't think a user can ultimately at the end of the day contract away rights that are that are conferred by the statute um, they might be able to contract away their ability to recover damages uh, but I, I don't think you can uh, contract away the the ability for them to bring a claim under this necessarily um, but uh, I think probably more to uh, your your point uh, is that I do think you probably could uh, limit to some degree the the amount of damages somebody could recover uh, or force them into a, uh, a non-judicial forum such as arbitration or mediation uh, or you know, force them to sue you in another state. Um, those are all certainly possible things, but I don't think you can actually contract away uh, with the way this is written the the ability to bring a claim uh, you can limit it you can sort of force it to to be brought where you want it to be brought but uh it doesn't really allow for because it would ultimately be that contract would be void as against public policy uh and you get a whole bunch of lawyers involved and we all have fun with those type of issues um that's kind of the basics of both of these statutes or these proposed statutes um, I know I mentioned previously that 394 is kind of at a standstill. It's uh, it's not moving along from the best I can tell on the Senate website. I don't know if anybody else has looked into it and kind of figured out exactly where it is. Um, it, it's sort of interesting that the when you compare the two and compare who's sponsoring both 393 and 394, uh, they have significant overlap of the the senators who are sponsoring it. Um, and David's asking a question about uh, Florida passing something similar to 393 uh, and do what's going on with that. I, I actually do not know. Um, I would suspect um, if something similar to this was passed, uh, that there would be some sort of constitutional challenge to it. Uh, and yeah, I, they would probably enjoin it uh, just on a basis of uh, let's test the constitutional merits of it before it's enacted. Uh, courts typically do do that unless it is some sort of clear situation where uh, you, you, you know, you're never going to stop the thing. Uh, and so I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's a very good question. Uh, and it'd be interesting to see if uh, something along those lines doesn't affect how uh, the Georgia Senate, the Georgia House, or Georgia governor uh, reacts to something like 393 or perhaps changes it if it gets enjoined by some federal judge. Um, Scott, I know you were going to do a question and answer. I don't know if you want to continue doing it in um, the, the chat or if you wanted to do it in another mechanism. Uh, Aaron asked uh, 394, it, it, should it be something we're encouraging our state center to support? Um, I, Aaron, I, I kind of try to be neutral uh, about whether or not people should support these or not. I try to just describe the the way they function. Uh, I think, uh, if I understand correctly, Scott, uh, that that uh, EFF has somewhat of a position on it, but I'm, I'm not 
certain about that, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of y'all. Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, EFF and Electronic Frontiers Georgia are separate uh, entities, that we're separate organizations, and we're connected through the Electronic Frontier Alliance. But uh, as far as EFF, um, uh, the bigger organization, uh, they did review 394, and they gave it uh, mostly pretty high marks. Um, most, I, I think after reviewing it myself, one of the concerns I have is that um, actually is is pretty good in a sense of having uh, real enforcement. Um, it is probably better, much better than the Virginia bill in that in that sense, the Virginia law. Um, it's got the private right of action, and also the attorney general um, can come in on an action uh, regarding the privacy. I think the one of the concerns I have is um that uh, the attorney general's offices in many states have become a lot more politicized than they used to be and so i think it opens the door for selective enforcement um for maybe opening uh you know cases against certain businesses and not against others um and my other concern about 394 especially is um maybe in terms of scope i wonder if it pulls in businesses that it didn't intend to pull in like uh, AT&T, Home Depot, and things like that. If that's true, then you could see other businesses weigh in against it that, that haven't considered it because it looks like on its face, it's a big tech bill, but it might be much bigger than that. And if you consider the businesses in uh, Georgia that have, that are more than $50 million businesses, there, there's, there's, there's quite a few of those that, that aren't big tech companies. So uh, you gotta have to go back and check, but I wonder where the dividing line is on that. Uh, and, and John asked a question about whether or not uh, other state, well, not necessarily other state actors, but other other actors, other agencies could enforce 394. And the, the quick answer to that is no. Um, the, the way the Georgia Constitution is set up, uh, there, there's no mechanism uh, for a state agency to act and be outside of the Attorney General's office, with the exception of if the governor directs the attorney general's office to do something and the attorney general's office refuses uh, because it is still a constitutional office, but it's an inferior constitutional office. Uh, the uh, governor can then appoint a special assistant attorney general uh, or in some context, hire a district attorney who is another constitutional officer in the state of Georgia uh, to act as a special assistant attorney general um, to enforce it, but the um, there's really no mechanism for a local or state agency to enforce uh, 394, um, and, and there's nothing in it that allows for a collective action uh, like uh, the 393 did. Um, so you're basically limited to uh, private rights of action by individuals or by enforcement of the attorney general's office. Um, and David asked if there was uh, any specific language you might want to discuss being amended. Um, I, I'll, I will defer to Scott on that. I, I don't know of anything in it that, from a perspective of being passed uh, legally, I don't know of anything that, that just strikes me as being problematic that would call someone from a legal perspective to say, uh, you know, hey, We've got to pump the brakes and fix this. Um, there certainly might be ways to limit things so you don't have unintended consequences. Um, you know, I've always heard since I was a child in uh, basically every civics class that making laws is like making sausage, and sometimes you get chunks of fat in there you don't intend to have. Um, and you know, there's always unintended consequences of legislation. Um, but I don't know of anything that is certainly problematic from a legal perspective that would need to be changed to, to get people to support it. Um, and yeah, I want to, um, yeah, I want to say that, that, yeah, our question and answer session is open. So if you want to jump in with the microphone or the camera, feel free to do so at this time. Uh, um, but in terms of having, you know, I haven't had enough, um, really haven't had enough time this year uh, this year to do as much 
um, work on some of the bills other than identifying the bills. Um, uh, we, I guess, you know, we have asked EFF for some help, but we haven't done as much analysis and I haven't done as much analysis as I'd like to for this year. So uh, I can't pin down anything specifically yet, but you know, I'd love to, to be uh, working on that more. I think we'll have some opportunity as this goes over to the house side, particularly for 393, because 394 doesn't seem to be moving yet at this time. Uh, it's got until crossover day, which is roughly around the 15th. I'm not exactly sure when, but it's around that time. Um, to, to you know, if it doesn't if it doesn't pass by that time, the bills in Georgia live for two years, so it could come back next year. But I think the, the political dynamic will be a lot different next year than it is this year. Um, so I see Bridget is is uh, on now. So if you've got a question, go ahead with it. Yes, thank you. First of all, thanks for the presentation, Ryan. Um, I wanted to know what event encouraged the legislation on um, 393 to be introduced. And I was wondering if uh, legislation like that could be used to fight the censorship that's going on on various websites, such as YouTube, Facebook, things like that. That's my first question. And then my second question is related to the Earn It Bill, which was first introduced March 12th of 2020, the same day everyone went out and bought all the toilet paper. Everyone was focused on toilet paper. They first introduced that bill, which was masqueraded as a child protection law, but it actually took away our encryption, which took away our privacy online. So I'm just wondering how this bill could circumvent that, that law or if it's related. And, and uh, to, to your first question, um, you know, it would be conjecture completely on my part to try and figure, you know, to, to tell you what, what I thought this was a reaction to. Uh, I know somebody had noted uh, in the chat box a few minutes ago that there was one, two, three, four, five other states that have uh, attempted to pass something similar to 393. Uh, I, I think it's a reaction to just what's been going on at a, a, a very high level in terms of uh, what we've seen social media companies do in the past, say, five years. Um, I mean, I've been seeing people get demonetized on YouTube. Uh, usually about this time of night uh, is when I'm watching YouTube videos randomly on my iPad and going down rabbit holes, and you'll see people talking about being demonetized, whether it's uh, wrestling YouTube's. Uh, that I watch or, or anything else for any variety of reasons. And so, so I, I think it's just a reaction to uh, to what's been going on. Uh, I think certainly the banning of certain people uh, in politics probably has something to do with it from, from various websites. Um, yeah, I think it also has something to do with just the fact that, that more and more people are becoming um, I don't, I don't want to say self-aware, but more aware of how social media works and it's becoming more and more ubiquitous. Um, you know, there are people that I didn't think when, when I was in high school would ever be using a computer, have uh, Facebook now on their phone uh, in my hometown. So uh, I think it's a combination of things. I don't know that I could point to a single thing uh, that, that was the cause of it or not. Uh, because ultimately I, I didn't write this and I didn't offer it and uh, I've not asked any of these people, even though I know a few of them who are the senators that are sponsoring it. So um, with respect to the, the Earn It Act, I, I don't know how how much it interplays with that or not. I have not, I, I didn't think about that uh, when I was looking over last... this. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that is certainly an interesting thought and um, you know, I, I just, I don't know off the top of my head how it would interact with that. Yeah, I want to jump in on Earn It. Um, the Earn It has come back to life in the, uh, it was two years ago and now it's come back to life. I'm hoping to do that as the next topic, but I'm having to, I'm looking for a speaker now. Um, so we're mostly focused on the state law tonight and uh, Earn It is federal. So, but, but yeah, yeah, it's a fair question to ask what the inner, play is between the two and what the, you know, what the interconnection would be between the two. Yeah. My last point, they do seem to be opposing each other. 
And so that's why I was just wondering what correlation you see or how how one could be enforced versus the other. And with the first point I was making, I, I really was asking that question about what event inspired that legislation, just because I got the impression from it that um, the same thing that I've been experiencing, that I get censored on things from not speaking about COVID and 5G in the same video on YouTube, or, you know, there's been, there have been doctors videos um, where they were explaining uh, things about COVID or things about how we should respond to it, that we didn't need a vaccine. And those uh, videos were all taken down. And, you know, when you follow the money and follow everything and you figure out that, you know, it's all funded by Bill Gates and a lot of his friends, then you're like, okay, we need something to, um, to, to fight that law. And then even on Facebook, we have things like conversations like, um, okay, I support Trump. Or, you know, it's like if I say certain things that uh, where I'm disagreeing with someone else, they're like literally um, censoring people and uh, making people uh, get off of social media for a certain amount of time just because of their opinions on things. And nobody's threatening anyone. No one's uh, making lewd or, you know, lewd comments or things like that. So we really do need protection with things like that. I, you know, I don't know why the bill was first introduced, but I, speaking from my end of things, something needs to change on that, on that end. And, and, and that sort of what makes sense. I, I, you know, I, I like to approach uh, particularly technology related legislation from the perspective that the law is still trying to catch up with technology and it's never going to catch up completely. Um, but we're not that far removed from, uh, was it, who, who was it, was the senator from Alaska, Ted Stevens, uh, that said the internet was a series of tubes. Uh, and he, he did not mean it in, in the way that it actually sort of was a series of tubes. He meant it uh, because he didn't understand it. Um, and you know, the law is very similar. I'll tell you, I, I get on soapbox a lot with other lawyers about how uh, we've got to adapt to the times and adapt to technology and we're getting better. Uh, but as a profession, uh, and unfortunately, my profession feeds uh, the judicial branch because one of the requirements is that you have been a practicing attorney to be a judge. Uh, you know, we're just not there um, in terms of a robust understanding how it works. You have some folks who, who have it, um, you know, IP litigators, probably ahead of me. Uh, you've got folks who have programming backgrounds far ahead of me. And then you've got some, you know, poor, poor lawyers in middle Georgia that uh, just know how to use a computer pretty well. And we look like we really know what's going on. So um, I think a large part of it has to do, though, with, uh, you know, people are just getting to the point where they use social media so much that that, that it's 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 catching up and it's catching up to the law faster than the law can react to it uh, and the use is catching up faster than the law can react so um yeah i, I think it's a fair point to bring up Thank i you. want to make a yeah i wanted to 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 reinforce a point about um social media and the internet in general um that social media is not a town square uh, in the sense of, of being a public park. Um, and it's also not, not a common carrier, despite the claims to the contrary in the act, because uh, that's a case where you have a, a private company that's given a particular service area in exchange for taking any and every legal comer that, 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 that's there. I mean, uh, uh, the best analogy for social media is that it's more like a shopping mall. If you go to a shopping mall, you know it's open to the public during certain hours under certain conditions. But you know the moment that you set foot on in a shopping mall, it's private property. And if the security guard on in private in a private business doesn't like you, they can discriminate against you. They can throw you out for the, the worst of reasons. And I'm not saying that there's no discrimination. I'm not saying it, it doesn't have a political slant or anything like that, but it's private property. And even stronger than 
if you look at the values of our society, even more strongly than the First Amendment, we value private property. And that's something that came down from common law. It's very, very powerful in, in our body of law. And so before we even get to a First Amendment question, we really have to think about this is private property. Now, if the government owned the, um, owned the, the social media uh, company, lock, stock, and barrel, I think it'd be a different question and a very different discussion that we're having. But it's not just the social media company that's, that's privately owned. Pretty much the entire internet is privately owned. And this means that even if you have um, a social media uh, company with a wide open, very wide open policy that's just wide open to everything, it's possible that the backbone provider, which is a private company, will decide not to route those packets. And uh, there's no First Amendment right to have your packets being routed by a private company. Um, and so if they consider your, if they consider uh, uh, the content from a social media so incredibly toxic that they would lose business, which is a lot of what's happening these days with the signaling that's going on, they might decide to, to not route your packets and, and not, uh, not send the packets from that particular company to the rest of, of the users. So um, we decided on a model um, that's a, uh, of internet ownership that's completely privatized and is very different than other um, countries, including democracies. And we just don't have any portion of it, virtually no portion of it. Um, once I, I even, I think once upon a time we did have NSFnet, but aside from that, no portion of it has ever been owned by the government. And so it's all been private property and private property rights are very strong. And, and you have to think about it in those terms. Um, so I noticed that Katach has his uh, hand raised. Uh, did you want to turn on your microphone or turn on your speaker and say a few words? I'm not hearing you yet. I'm seeing you. There, okay. There, there you go. Better? I got you. Okay. Go yeah. ahead. New headset just arrived today. Um, one of the things I've noticed is with a lot of these bills, it seems to be written by people that, let's be honest, are not the smartest brains in technology. They are the sort of people who used to call them 20 odd years ago midnight flashes. And the power goes off, their VCRs would be flashing midnight for months and months and months. And now they're trying to write all these tech bills. There was a, um, a hearing, I think Monday, where a lot of these same uh, things were brought up in a, a U.S. House subcommittee. And that's the big problem is they seem to just think they can lie about it, push it through, and have somebody else nerd harder to, to deal with the consequences of their ignorance. And that's where I, I get a lot of these bills are. They seem to think that they don't understand what they're doing, and they seem to cherish that ignorance. And that is a huge problem with all these bills that they think that um, the, the, the comments, the, the questions, um, they're the only ones that matter. And the fact that they are some kind of fancy lawyer or something. My congressman down here, I'm, I'm down towards the Columbus area. And um, he's the deputy whip for the GOP party, the district just below Taylor Green, uh, Drew Ferguson. And he's... Uh, he loves to, to, to prattle on about his uh, ignorance of technology. Um, he was a dentist. And um, every time he pushes through technology, it, it, it's really, really bad. My old congressman, um, Austin Scott, over in Macon, used to be an insurance salesman. His son, his 13-year-old son, used to do all his tech stuff for him. And that's, that's the sort of ignorance we're dealing with when it comes to these tech bills that people just don't get it. They don't seem to want to get it. And they think that what they want can just be magically fixed by having some other smart people just nerd her to be harder because they told them to. And that seems to be endemic with all these kinds of bills. Not really a question, but... Uh... Yeah, I mean, as a comment, I, I think maybe... Um, the, the problem is it's getting away from a market-driven approach. We've had, a, um, I guess, a, a long history with internet technology of solutions looking for problems. 
Um, but this this kind of gets away with that. That the you know the I, the phrase that that you mentioned is nerd harder. That basically um, the the uh, legislator that doesn't understand the technology at all can go out and pass a law that says, well, you've got to build a solution that does this with with no idea of of the feasibility of of doing that solution or the difficulty of doing that. And in some cases, it's just going to be infeasible. And I don't know, you know, when you get into court and the rubber meets the road, I I you know I just don't know how that's going to work out. And, you know, kind of to that point, I, I think that's going to be a problem forever, uh, so long as we've got the system that we've got. And, and I say that and not trying to be flippant about it, I mean, because it, it's a very, very salient point. Um, but the ultimate problem is we don't have a bunch of experts writing these laws and acting as our legislators. We have people that, particularly the Georgia legislature, they're, they're all they all have day jobs for lack of a better descriptor they, they they're not legislators full-time um and you know, while congressmen and congresswomen are, are, are full-time politicians and full-time congresswomen and congressmen um they still you know you're getting a a swap of people you're not getting um this many doctors and this many lawyers and this many uh astrophysicists and this many uh, bankers, you're you're getting people from all sorts of walks of life who have very different backgrounds and very different life experiences. I, I really don't foresee us substantially changing the system uh, such that we ever get away from that. And so, I think that's just always going to be a problem. Which is sort of why having talks like this are really good is so that people can be aware and so they can interact with uh, their their representatives. But you know, I, I do tend to agree that I think the technology kind of falls to the wayside, at least from a legislative perspective, uh, because, you know, I had a physical science professor uh, when I was an undergrad that uh, would explain electricity tongue in cheek as the, the magical gnomes in the sockets. Um, you know, we, we don't think about how the electricity gets to our VCR. Uh, we just know that it comes out of that socket. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think about the process that it necessarily has to undergo to get from a uh, power plant to a power line to a transformer to down the road to your house and then get inverted or converted or whatever happens before it gets to your device and what each capacitor does. Uh, and so, you know, everything is complex. There's nothing in this life that is simple. Uh, and I don't know of a way to solve that other than just trying to be proactive and, and engage. Um, but, but it's a very good point. You know, I, I, I said earlier, and I think somebody made the comment uh, earlier that, you know, there's a lot of contradictory stuff in 393 that just sort of makes it a, it, where it really doesn't achieve anything when you start looking at the loopholes at least. Uh, from my perspective as a lawyer, if I had to defend a company that was uh, being sued for it, I could say, well, you know, this is something that they expressly can do because uh, we define that as obscene and you didn't define what obscenity is. And uh, so, uh, you know, thanks for coming, but that's all folks, we're done. Um, it, it's a, it, it feels almost like a feel good type of legislation in some respects, uh, or, or just a reactionary legislation that, you know, it, it, if you took it completely at, you know, oh, well, we don't think common carriers should discriminate against uh, people's ideas. Uh, you're saying that out loud is very, you know, non offensive. It seems like you could say, oh, well, that seems like a good idea. But when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, it just, your nuts and bolts aren't connecting. Um, yeah, because that ends up becoming compelled um, association under the First Amendment. Yeah. Uh, compelling, those who don't know, compelled association means that you're basically forcing them to carry your speech, therefore not letting them deny um, their, their right of free speech to be associated with you or not to be associated with you. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, uh, 
I see Chuck has his hand raised. Uh, did you want to jump in, Chuck? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, from what we've heard so far, it sounds like that uh, 394 has some good pieces, and we are liking that. And uh, we may actually even want to let our senators know that uh, even though we're not seeing movement on it right now, that we'd like to see movement on it and what's what's got it stalled. So that might be one point to make that that might be something some of us would want to do. But I think what's even more important is the 393. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of agreement that there's problems with it. And so I'm curious what the group here thinks in terms of uh, is it worth uh, asking for something to be changed, amended or reworked, or are we looking to do a tactic where we get it stalled out and it never gets anywhere because it's just terrible? Um, personally, I would say the latter. Uh, because I don't really see enough of it that looks like it's worth doing anything with. And I don't think that they're very, uh, I don't think that they're, I don't think they know what they're doing. I think that there actually is an intent. And if some of us could walk around in the hallways down there in one of the legislative buildings, we might actually hear what someone really thought because they would say they wanted to do this and it would be completely, you know, out of the box compared to what they've come up with. But um, that's, I've seen that personally before, so I know that's what they do, but I don't really know what that is. And it sounds like that we need to get rid of 393 and make sure that it doesn't go through. Um, what does anybody else think about that? Well, I, I mean, I'll say that, you know, I think that, um, I need to sit down and, and work on, uh, a position, I guess, position, you know, a position paper on all the bills we're tracking and, and include 393 in that. And, uh, you know, I guess at this point, we, we've got um, a bunch of people here. I need to ask, it, would anybody like to help work on that? Um, there's this not the only other, uh, this not the only bill that we're looking at. These are not the only two bills that we're looking at. I did narrow the focus, but I mean, we've got a, 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 a school filtering bill for internet filtering that we need to look at. We've got another, a, a couple of other bills. Um, and this is really, this year is, is, uh, I've been tracking technology legislation for many years in Georgia, and, and this is this year it has it has some of the the greatest number of technology related bills that I think I've ever seen. Um, I think part of it is the political dynamic of this year, but also um, part of it is just increasing awareness of, of technology in general. And I think we're going to see more and more of them. So it's getting harder and harder for me to sit down and, and do all this. So. I think maybe uh, one of the questions I have tonight is would anybody like to, to join in on the effort if we, if we do, um, you know, if we, if we sit down maybe over the weekend, maybe on an evening and, and uh, work on this together. And yeah, you can, it, I see Bridget is responding, so I'll go ahead and, and uh, include you on that, but you can, you can put your information on the chat if you'd like to work on this. David. Okay. Yeah, I, I would love to put together a standing committee for legislative review. You know, I would call it LRC or Legislative Review Committee. It's something I'd love to be able to do every year, but um, I haven't been able to get get that going yet. But I, you know, I'd love to do that as a standing committee every year. But we can certainly pull something together ad hoc and um, and work on it. And I see uh, David and Bridget have responded. Um, are there any other questions tonight? Okay, and then, then KitKat also. Any other questions tonight about 393 or 394? Okay, I'm going to take a minute here and let's see. I wanted to, I didn't have this ready to go, so I need to look it up in my browser, but I think it's 1217. Um, so we have 1217 also. This is very different than everything else that we've done tonight. So I'm I'm kind of straying off the, the path here, but this is another one that we're looking at. Um, and I wanted to bring it up and it's something that we should really comment on. Uh, let me see if I can get to it. And if I share this, 
Um, this is a Student Technology Protection Act, and it, it does several things, but one of the things it does is it, is it, mandates, um, it mandates filtering um, in the schools, and that's already done at the federal level by, the, the, by CEPA, the Child Internet Protection Act. And SEPA has been reviewed by the Supreme Court and um, has, has been found to be constitutional. So there's no constitutional question against filtering of internet, uh, of, of, you know, against filtering of internet in schools. I think that um, maybe the issue here is that this is a bill that re required the purchase of new filtering software by local school districts and there's no funding being provided and so one of the biggest issues i found is is with the funding now there's always a concern about um filtering software and whether it will filter in a way that that's kind of fair and above the board above board and um will it filter you know will it make uh, certain marginalized communities feel um left out or, or feel ashamed or something like that at a time when uh you know in the schools at a time when you have a lot of young people that are starting to explore their identity and that is a potential problem one thing i will say that's good about 1217 is that it does encourage not just allow but encourage parental involvement so it's important if, if this does pass and i don't think it's a good idea for it to pass but if it does pass um, I would say that it's a, uh, very important that uh, parents of all political persuasions engage um, their local school boards exactly as described in the bill. But this is another thing that we're looking at. I want to pull together a list of other things that we could look at. And uh, we'll find a time that we can get together, maybe a couple of us, and, and talk about these. Um, did you have, uh, I guess, let me go ahead and turn this off, but uh, are there yeah, any but... remaining questions about 393 or 394? And also I wanted to ask Ron, do you have any, any closing comments? I, I don't really have any too many closing comments other than, you know, I think from a practicing attorney standpoint, um, with, with all due respect to, to everybody else's comments, uh, 393 for me is the the more difficult one to try and, and deal with from a practice perspective. Uh, 394 uh, is, I think, ultimately better written and from a functional level and having to deal with it as a practicing attorney. Uh, makes more sense. Um, you know, I, I'm not here to tell you whether something's good law, bad law, or, or not. Uh, I'm just trying to look at it from the legal perspective of, of how it works and how it functions. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good comments about both. Uh, and, and I know most of our actual discussion kind of back and forth has been 393, but I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of things that allow for private rights of action. Uh, and not just because I have a business, um, you know, a business interest in private rights of action. I, I think from just a perspective of enforcement mechanisms that private rights of action are uh, one of the greatest tools there are uh, to, and particularly when you have a statute that authorizes uh, what we call fish shifting and allows for uh, the playing field to get leveled. Um, I, I think that is just a, probably government at, at its finest when you can just go to the courts and get redress uh, for violations of statutes. So um, I, I appreciated all the thoughts and all the questions. And uh, Scott, you having me here and hope, hope I've had something useful to say that um, people can uh, at least can say they learned something about one of these or both of these. Yeah, I really want to thank you for for coming out. Um, it's not just um, uh, not just the fact that you're a Georgia attorney, but also it it crosses over into your practice area, and so I think this is uh, it's really good to have your perspective. And I really want to thank you for making the time this evening and coming out and talking to us. Uh, I think we'll have a lot of a uh, lot of 
uh, comments going on, and I think the conversation should continue. But um, I need to go ahead and start wrapping up the recording, the official part. We will hang out here kind of unofficially. I actually have to uh, go do some work-related stuff at 9 o'clock, but between now and, and 9 p.m., we can hang out on the channel and, and kind of uh, chat uh, casually. Um, but again, as far as the stream and recording, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up and say uh, one more hearty thank you for coming out. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope we, uh, we we'll, uh, uh, we'll can continue this conversation. And, uh, you know, I hope to see you again at, at DragonCon this year. Um, that would be a very good thing. Um, and I would thank you to the audience too for the, uh, for the comments and questions and your engagement tonight.